Well, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Jim Chalmers. Uh, now we're going to move to uh, one of the, the, the really challenging parts of banking, I think, which is uh, financial difficulty. Um, and um, I think possibly some Australians, for the first time, actually found themselves in trouble during the pandemic. Uh, there was a pretty big Team Australia effort to get people to reach out and access support from the banks. Uh, but the government pandemic support for the banks is retreating. So how are Australians doing now? And how will they go with all these new digital products? Uh, my panel, I've got some very obedient panels today, are already in place. Uh, and let me, let me introduce them. From the far right, Joe Masters, who's actually just landed a very exciting new job this week. Uh, is, she's joining the high-octane Baron Joey, uh, investment banker's chief economist, after three years as EY's chief economist. Uh, and then we, ha and David Locke is um, chief ombudsman and CEO of the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. Between those two, Linda Evans is partner at Herbert Smith Freehills and regional head of practice for competition and regulation and trade. And closest to me, Fiona Guthrie, Chief Executive of the Financial Counselling Australia and a long-time champion of the financially vulnerable. So uh, welcome to all of you. Right, Joe. first, congratulations. Thank you very much. It's the great reshuffle of Australia. Yes, you've gone to the dark <laughs> side, even darker. Excellent. Uh, now... Uh, <laughs> Um, look, uh, let, let, me, let me kick off with you first. Tell us about households, though. Um, they were supported during COVID. They've got savings, but their cost of living issues must be coming. We've got rate rises coming. Uh, how are they going and what are the risks? Great. Um, so the household, in a macro sense, is in really good shape. We heard that from Governor Lowe this morning. $250 billion sitting in deposits, and that's just at ADIs. We've also seen about $100 billion put into mortgage offset accounts, and net household wealth has risen by 20% since the pandemic started. So the balance sheet looks really good. Um, what we're facing now, though, I guess, is a bit of a question mark about the cash flow. So we've got wage growth that's starting to accelerate, but again, we've heard this morning that that is quite slow. For most Australians, it's still sitting at two point something to steal Governor Lowe's uh, term. We've got petrol prices, which are an essential good that we buy, rising. We've got headline inflation rising. Uh, we've got interest rates now that clearly are going up, and fixed rates have already gone up. Mm. So, uh, it, you know, so we've got slower wage growth, but rising um, expenses for households. Mm. And I guess the way that I think about it when we go forward is two questions. The first one is, okay, in that environment, how quickly or how easily do households lean on that war chest of savings? Mm. One question we don't really know is, where are all those savings? So it becomes a distributional issue. Are those that have savings, are they the ones that are gonna face the, the real sort of cost of living pressure? Um, so, so I think that's a really important one. And the second one is, as we start this tightening cycle, mm. as we always know, and I don't need to tell people that work in the banking sector, um, the median household looks okay, but it's the tail risk where you get into trouble. All right, Fiona, down at the grassroots level, can you help answer that question at all? Uh, where, you know, where, 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 the, where the savings are? Are they widely distributed or are they... Not, not in the people we see, Tiki. So there's no doubt that lots of Australians did really well during the pandemic, but there's a whole lot of people who are missing out and are still missing out. And my concern, it's great to think that the economy in many ways is going to do quite well, but it's, there's a really important role for the banking industry to not lose focus on the group of people who are living on low fixed incomes. So, mm. job so, seekers so 315 you know, I mean, bucks a week. Of what sort of problems, if I could drill down on that, uh, what sort of problems are you seeing? And, and actually, was there a drop in problems during COVID? Or? Oh, it's, look, I, I, it, it makes me laugh the way we talk about evidence-based policy, because when we get the evidence, we ignore it. So we just saw during the pandemic the greatest social experiment we've probably seen in Australia, where we doubled the level of unemployment benefits. We thought at the start of the pandemic, 
We help people in financial hardship. We thought things would go through the roof. They've done the opposite. And that was because people had enough money to live on for the first time. And the great work of the banking industry and the electricity industry and debt collection. So all of those things played a factor. And now we're back to the same environment. That's just maths, isn't it? The cost mm. of living is going up. You're on a low fixed income. You can't get places to rent. People don't have enough money. They're turning to buy now, pay later and wage advance companies. And so we've got this unregulated credit on top of regulated credit. Mm. So this is a recipe for disaster for a portion of the community and we've got to make sure that they are not left behind. Right. Linda, uh, you know, through COVID, there was this remarkable uh, loosening of the rules, wasn't there, for banks to uh, be allowed to, if you like, act in concert by the ACCC in order to help people out. How much of a difference did that actually make? And presumably that's all gone now, is it? Yeah, it was very much a temporary measure. Um, and it's important to remember that it was an arrangement that allowed the banks to coordinate about the mechanisms that they were going to put in place and about communication of those mechanisms. It wasn't actually an authority from the ACCC to agree on pricing, and it was always voluntary. Um, and Australia is one of the few places where those sort of mechanisms were readily available. And I think it played a very important role in providing certainty um, and security and easy communication mechanisms. Mm. David, did you, do you think uh, the message uh, got out? I mean, what did you hear, that the, that the COVID support was available? Did it get through to everybody who needed it? Uh, the, the, the banks did an astonishing job. They did, they did an astonishing job during very, very difficult circumstances. Mm. Um, uh, logistically, handling the number of deferrals that were dealt with, in the period that they were handled, um, when you had offshore contact centers out of action and all sorts of challenges, it was really quite extraordinary. And that and the government support is what made the, the massive difference. Uh, and we saw a 40% reduction in financial difficulty cases coming to us during COVID. And we haven't seen that go back up. And I think a lot of that is because what we're seeing, and we're very conscious, we're only seeing part of the picture. We're not seeing what Fiona's seeing um, on the front line. Yeah. But I think what we have seen is significant improvement and investment in um, financial difficulty resources and um, really um, you know, great efforts made, particularly by the major banks, to really continue to support customers through this period. So, so, now, but yeah. we are still seeing, having said that, we do see increasingly the cases that are coming to us are people who are even more vulnerable. They're the people who didn't make it through COVID. Mm. They're the small businesses that didn't survive or who are just teetering on the edge. They're people with multiple complex um, problems and challenges. So do you think that um, obviously, that we had the Royal Commission, uh, and out of that came this really fresh attempt to, to radically change relationships with the customer, understanding the customer by, by the banks. Then you had the opportunity to, to fire, power, fire this up with COVID. Is what you're saying that actually that, that is now the lessons are learned, they've, they've, they've come through, and there's more engagement now from the banks? What we're seeing is that um, the first stage with our process is we give the banks an opportunity again to try and address complaints that are coming through to us. Mm. So they should have already been through the bank's own processes. Uh, the, the customer then comes to us, we refer it back to the banks. Mm. Uh, three and a half years ago when we started, we were getting about 40%, and in some cases, 25% of matters were being resolved by the banks at that stage. Mm. With the major banks, we're now seeing 65%, and in some cases, 75% of matters being resolved. Now, clearly, the sooner matters are resolved between the customer and the bank, mm. the better it is for everybody, as long as that's fair and to the satisfaction of the customer. And that is because there's been a huge investment in internal dispute resolution processes, and we've seen at the major banks as well, we've seen the board and senior management have a real focus around this. That's not the case throughout industry, though. Mm. 
Yeah. And we do have other parts of industry, other lenders, uh, uh, where actually things have gone backwards, haven't gone forwards. All right. So I do think, you know, there's some great work that's being done, but it's not across the whole, of course, of the credit industry. Yeah, but Joe, from where you're sitting, uh, that, that there isn't that easy analysis access to data on who's, who, where, where the savings are and, 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 and where they, they're not. Well, I, I think one of the good things that's come out of the pandemic is that the major banks are releasing some of their data and analysing some of their data, and it is giving us more granular view of what's happening in the economy and often more timely than the official stats. So yeah. I have seen um, some data from one of the major banks uh, published a piece that suggested uh, all sort of income quintiles had saved a bit of money, yeah. um, but um, we do know that uh, people on higher incomes have more capacity to save. We did also see a lot of young Australians save money during the pandemic. We all heard those anecdotes of younger Australians that were earning more on JobKeeper than they, they typically earned and they, they couldn't go out. And I have a teenage daughter in, in that situation. Mm. I'm really interested to see what these young Australians do with, with their savings. Mm. Um, do they invest in the future? Do they think about superannuation? Do they think about something other than Bitcoin? We've seen an increase in day traders. Are they moving up the risk curve? Um, so I think there is a role around financial literacy for young Australians um, who are in that very enviable position. Okay. Fiona, young Australians uh, and presumably other Australians as well uh, have embraced buy now, pay later in a way that uh, I think no one <laughs> really e expected. Um, it's not regulated at either end. Uh, what uh, are your concerns about buy now, pay later? Well, let's go back to evidence-based policy. We've got ASIC reports that show one in five people are missing payments, 15% of people are taking other loans to make payments, they're cutting down on food, financial counsellors are seeing more and more people coming with buy now, pay later debt, and this new product, Wage Advance, mm -hmm. using the same loophole in the credit laws. Uh, they're using it for groceries, electricity, you can use it at the pub, you can get it for a couple of hundred dollars you can get it up to $30,000. It essentially sits outside the laws. It does have, it's subject to ASIC's DDOs and PIP, but that's not nearly enough. We need to be doing what they're doing in the UK and New Zealand and looking at the regulatory framework for this. I just find it extraordinary. We invented this thing. It works for a lot of people. No one's saying we shouldn't have it. But the fact that it sits outside the regulatory framework and is allowed to harm a portion of the population to such a large extent, mm. and we're going to turn a blind eye to it, is, it, is ridiculous. So is, is that your sense of buy now, pay later? What's that? Is that your sense of buy now, pay, pay later as well? well to David. You're asking me. Well, yeah. I, I think... Uh, I think there are, there are concerns about people being able to access this without any credit checks. Uh, there are concerns about people having multiple accounts. The proliferation of this, and as you've said, Fiona, you can get plastic surgery on it. You can get almost anything on it. It, it works for many people in this room who may want to use it as a budgeting tool. Um, but the concern is really what happens to uh, uh, people who are... Uh, uh, having to use this really in order to put food on the table for the children. How do, you, how do you manage this? And increasingly what we're hearing is people presenting to financial counsellors and other services with multiple, multiple accounts um, and in really challenging situations. So uh, it, it, the situation for AFCA is that uh, most of these firms are not required to be members. The larger ones voluntarily are members, uh, but they're not mandated to be, required to be, because they fall outside the licensing arrangements. Is that right? Should your access to external dispute resolution depend upon a voluntary decision made by the company mm. um, when that isn't the case in other lending? Mm. Um, I think that's a question for government. So, and, and presumably the regulators as well, Linda. I, I mean, the uh, buy now, pay later, of course, falls outside the Credit Act. Um, what do you think it will take for regulators to bring it inside either the Credit Act or something else? 
Well, the ACCC tried um, when there was an authorisation application made in relation to actually solar um, arrangements. And the ACCC imposed a condition on their authorisation. Um, but then that was reviewed by the Competition Tribunal and they said, no, it wasn't actually the instalment payment mechanisms that caused an issue, it was just particular practices in that industry and so the condition was dropped. Mm -hmm. But I think Marnie summed it up very well earlier when she said, you know, there are three things that consumers need. It's protection, innovation and competition. And it's getting the balance between those three things right that is critical. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd suggest that there's a case that currently that balance isn't right in relation to these products. So that balance isn't right in relation to the, the, the consumer, the borrower, uh, using buy now, pay later. What about the merchants um, who are uh, not allowed to pass on uh, costs uh, that buy now, pay later is charging? In some cases, very large, um, very large margins. Um, now, the Reserve Bank has, again, used this innovation argument not to step up. But, um, you know, I'd suggest it's one reason why banks are just giving up and buying buy now, pay later and going into it themselves. Look, the question of innovation is always an important one. And the question of a level playing field, as some people have talked about, is an important one. Um, but it's really also important that people look to the future. Um, in 2016, um, the bank, a number of banks applied to the ACCC to enable them to collectively negotiate um, with Apple in relation to the Apple Pay arrangements. And they said being able to negotiate together and to walk away from a deal with Apple will actually you know, foster the opportunity for alternative um, payment mechanisms and digital wallets. And the ACCC said, no, um, we want to let the innovation of Apple play out over time and see what happens. And so they rejected that application um, because of the innovation argument. And now, you know, the ACCC, six years later, um, has an investigation on foot in relation to Apple's, the, the conduct that the banks identified. So and Rod Sims has said it's now actually very tricky to do anything about it. That's right. <laughs> you know, some might say, well, you had an opportunity six years ago. So it, it is difficult, um, but, you know, I think Innovation is important, but so is competition. And some you know, have identified this morning that there's not a level playing field because you know, the banks face significant hurdles in being able to compete with some of these products. Yeah. Um, David, of course, it's not just BNPL. I mean, there are other sort of similar financial products that are sort of looking at different, different time, time periods in the, in the cycle of somebody's cash flow, aren't they? Well, there, there are. There certainly are. And we, and we see, um, you know, people getting into real difficulty with, as a result of some of that. We've also, and it's been touched that's on today. presumably taking salary out ahead of That's right, like taking that, yeah. salary out ahead. Yeah. And this is increasing, isn't it? If you're, yeah. you're starting to see this. And pe pe people just get into a cycle then that they can't get out of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's really problematic. Um, we, we've also got, you know, when, when we've talked about today, horrendous problems with scams you know, massive increase in scamming activity that we're seeing. Uh, and increasingly, as during COVID, people have been uh, transitioning more to electronic um, uh, uh, means of, um, of banking. Then again, we've seen more issues with that. We saw a 75% increase in disputes around electronic transactions last year, mm. and about 50% of that related to scams. Um, mm. Increasingly, as branches close, we know that there is classically a particular demographic uh, of person that would go into banks, and they tend to be older Australians, but not exclusively. Uh, tend to be people who may be more cautious. Uh, certainly, uh, where you do have face-to-face uh, -face engagement, then there is the ability to be able to flag concerns to people, to alert people to transactions that may not look right, uh, to give people the opportunity to think again around that. Uh, of course, when you don't have that face-to-face -face engagement or telephone engagement, that's more difficult. And increasingly in regional and remote, um, as Anna has said, people will be doing their banking through Australia Post. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how are Australia Post staff around the country able to alert and identify and assist vulnerable consumers in those circumstances, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, as, and I think Peter King was saying this morning that really there needs to be one central, uh, you, you know, sense of people's creditworthiness. Um, 
but equally, there seems to be some innovation uh, from these, these new players. Uh, I know Anna was uh, suggesting it um, earlier to me that some of the innovations around creditworthiness, uh, because the default rates don't seem to be that much different at the moment. So some of the innovations like perhaps scraping data and looking at your ability to pay your phone bill may actually end up being you know, a good way and that, that banks could learn from that. Do you think we need to sort of shake up how creditworthiness is, is assessed, David? I, I, I don't know. I, I think you need to have a picture of uh, indebtedness if you are looking at whether to lend money to an individual. And I think the fact that you don't have that uh, clearly at the moment is problematic. Yeah. I, I think there may be innovative ways of, uh, of assisting that. I don't think innovation in itself is always for, for the better. Yeah. I, I was looking at some of the uh, some, some of the betting apps that are coming through that have got lots of new features being advertised on the television the other day, and I was thinking, well, that's, that's new, but um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily uh, going to improve society for the better. Yeah. So yeah. I do think these things, you know, you, 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 we, have to, we have to look at really um, not just what's intended, but what some of the unintended consequences can be. I was right. going to say, sometimes yeah. innovation's about predatory products too. Yeah. And also, I've been around a long time and I've heard this, there's not going to be innovation if you regulate for as long as I've been around, and I haven't noticed it's got lost so far. <laughs> right. yeah. Joe, uh, can I shift us to housing? Because um, I, I, I just want a sense of how you see the housing market um, at the moment, and particularly for first home buyers that perhaps haven't had time to build up the buffers. Uh, what's the risk there? Yeah, so first home buyers have a terrible challenge, right? Housing affordability, housing accessibility, particularly as low income. Quintiles, if you can manage to get over the deposit hurdle, and we know that the role of the family that you come from is playing a greater determining factor in that, which I think is a really worrying sort of social issue that, that we need to think about. Mm. Um, but we have, we did see early in the pandemic, first home buyers uh, increases the market share of new mortgages. Uh, now, that was partly house prices fell a bit in the first few months of the pandemic. Mm. And every time we see house prices fall, there's this latent demand of first home buyers, plenty of young Aussies that are living at home that are desperate to move out, and their parents are desperate for them to move out, right? <laughs> um, so, so we do see that. Um, so I think there's a couple of things that have happened, though, now. Um, there are plenty of forecasts out there now that are suggesting house prices may fall a little bit in 2023. Yes. And if you're fairly recent into the housing market, you're, that's more impactful on your balance sheet. We also saw a really high number of first home buyers take out fixed rate mortgages. Because mm. uh, obviously we had a period there where you could lock in at ultra low rates that we'd never ever seen before. But a large portion of those will roll off in two to three years time at significantly higher rates. I mean, fixed rates have already risen, you know, close to 100 basis points. And I just wonder how many of those first home buyers who are naturally really leveraged because of they're new into the market, they mm. haven't built a big buffer, they're facing some decline in prices probably. Mm. Um, I think they're a really vulnerable segment of the market. And this is, I was saying watch. earlier, this is a very different game from, from, from the cash rate moving from, you know, I don't know, six to eight, uh, moving from effectively naught to two. For oh. these guys, is a much bigger deal, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just in proportion sense, it's, yeah. you know, uh, it's significantly. And we've talked quite a bit this morning about the serviceability buffer, and, and that is absolutely important. But we, but we also know that um, mortgages often look at HEM. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people living in Sydney that um, spend more than, than that min minimum expenditure in their day-to-day -day living. So I do think it's one of the most exposed parts of the market, most vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, Fiona, obviously, for those, for those um, people who are vulnerable but do also have a mortgage as part of their commitments, presumably that's one of the things that they're trying to make sure they keep, they, they keep going. But if they've, if they've got, um, say, other access to finance, which they can build up debts, um, are we going to see more, more defaults, do you think, on mortgages? That's a $64 million question, so mm. it's, it's really uncertain. But possibly. Mm. I mean, 
who can who can tell really? We know that people do everything to keep their home. We're certainly seeing people now who are rolling off the deferrals and and are really struggling to pay back debts because interest hasn't been capitalised. Yeah. So that those kind of problems are already there for some people. Yeah. I'm particularly worried about what's going to happen with some of the small businesses. We have a small business debt helpline, and small businesses are so self-sufficient and they keep it to themselves. And if interest rates go up, they're going to go up for them as well, the yes. mortgage holders. And so there's going to be that kind of effect to play out through the economy. Yeah. And it's not just their business debt, they'll have personal they'll have debt, their, which will be... Which their house will, will be their security yeah. for that mm. business debt. Mm. And there's some terrible, uh, there's some awful predatory practices in small business lending. Mm. And, um, and Linda, I should just ask you actually, the, but the, um, I think, think APRA's rules are, are now making it easier to assess loans, not so much for but small businesses based on, 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 on just their house, but it's, it's made it easier to look at cash flows and that sort of thing, is that right? There are, there are changes and there are a range of different regulatory mechanisms that can be used to assess some of these things. But it, I mean, there's an, there's two questions, I think. One is sort of what are the regulatory requirements and then second, how do you regulate practices that might occur and how do you deal with what might be unfair or sharp practices? Okay. I, I'd just say there's also an awful lot of people who have drawn down on their super during COVID and mm -hmm. taken all of their super in, in some circumstances and, and that will disproportionately impact women as well. So you start to see some of the challenges there and then you get something like relationship breakdown or loss of job or health issues and you're not far from a crisis. There's a lot of people who are very heavily leveraged um, do, and you only need one of those incidents. Do you, any of you think that cost of living, obviously we're seeing it at the petrol pump at the moment, but cost of living will be one of the top issues this election? Definitely. You think it will? Yeah, you absolutely. Think it will. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's any number of issues. There's, you know, obviously, oh, well, there's the car key election. <laughs> there's a whole lot of issues. There's, uh, yeah, there's Me Too. There's all sorts of things playing around. But do you think it'll come back to, I mean, it often does, uh, just the, the cost of living crisis that, that might be ahead? Well, it's often around people, it's often around not necessarily what's happening at the moment, but it's anxiety for the future, isn't it? It, it is really around that. Um, how optimistic people are about their family's financial future. Mm. Um, and if that is playing out, then that will have an impact. There is a little bit of an offset that we haven't talked about, yeah. um, which is that we have uh, incredibly low unemployment, unemployment that's expected to hit a 50-year low. We've got female participation in the workforce that is higher than it was pre-pandemic. We know that job security is very high at the moment. People feel confident that they will have a job in 12 months. Um, so not, that's not everybody, but we do have more Australians working today yeah. you know, than, than we would have expected during the pandemic. Um, and we are seeing wage growth start to pick up and we are expecting it to pick up across the economy. So for me, when I think about the election, it's very front of mind right now. You fill up your car, you can see it, you can yeah. feel it. And the, the issue is that it's going to take time for wage growth to pick up. But, but I, what but, about real wage growth? So real wage growth, I think, will be... Well, it's negative, but yeah. it, it won't be, I don't think, in 12 months' time. I think in 12 months' time, some of that supply-side constraint will come off the headline inflation rate, and at that time, we'll see this acceleration in wage growth. So it's a critical issue right now will be less of an issue in a year's time. And I think it's really important that we've got people in jobs. That's the most important thing. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, now, Linda, let me just come back to um, this space where ahead of us in digital. Um, I, I want to ask you what other things the ACCC is looking at in the, in the finance industry that perhaps banks should keep an eye on. Well, I think um, the ACCC recently issued a discussion paper, which is the fifth in its series in the digital platform inquiry. And this is perhaps the broadest scope, almost broadly scoped um, discussion paper that they have released. And it reflects the fact that, as people have said today, that the digital um, economy is becoming such part and parcel of everyday life. And it is really very much um, an invitation by the ACCC for um, 
everyone in industry to comment about, you know, what should the rules look like going forward. I think that certainly um, Rod Sims for some time and um, certainly in his last few weeks as chair of the ACCC is being very vocal in saying that he doesn't think that the current regulatory system is adequate um, and that this digital space, including sort of digital payments, requires increased levels of regulation. And he seems to be saying that it requires very specific regulation targeted directly to these types of companies. Um, I don't think it'll look like the media bargaining code, but um, he's certainly not talking about at the moment general principles-based regulation, but something quite targeted. Mm. Okay. Um, one of the things the governor spent quite a lot of time on in his speech this morning was uh, the idea of digital currency um, and, and tokens, and, and that actually central banks together were doing quite a lot of thinking around this. Some people say that if we adopted it and could get over the problems, that this might be more inclusive uh, for society because it would mean that people without bank accounts could potentially participate. Is there any thought from the panel that this would be a better place, a more inclusive way of doing things? Well, Fiona, do you want well, to? I mean, Australia has a really high take up of bank accounts because social security payments require a bank account. We don't have the problem they have in the United States. So I find that quite an odd argument. Right. And I mean, we haven't seen uh, crypto problems in financial counselling, but I can't understand what the underlying asset is that you're investing in. Yes, well... And a lot of people are... You're not Robinson Crusoe there, yeah. are you? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it just seems to me there's got to be a reckoning at some point, yeah. doesn't there? Yeah. And, it's, it, and it goes to the scam issue. We're seeing a lot of scams as well, and crypto yeah. scams. And, yeah. and also, and, and, and particularly with interest rates being low as well, people are looking at all sorts of vehicles or yeah. online incentives to invest or to trade. Lots of organisations saying they'll, they'll train people up to trade, and then all of a sudden you have ordinary people who really have no idea what they're doing involved in FX trading. Yeah. Which, I mean, yeah. you, you, honestly, and losing significant sums. So, David, perhaps I could finish by asking you, what would you like to see more of from, from banks in the complaints process or in any other field? Well, with, 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 with all of it, I mean... AFCA's jurisdiction is what is fair in all the circumstances of the case. So what we want to, to see banks continue to do is to treat customers fairly. And, and, and the, the secret to resolving issues is, is very often around communication. And, and where we've seen this, this real step change, as we have done, that has been because of huge investment and effort that's been put into communicating with and working with customers. And we want to see that continue mm -hmm. and to develop. And where there's really good practices there is um, in, in, uh, uh, that I've talked about, we want to see that expanded. And it is an area, financial difficulty and some of this scam stuff, is an area where actually uh, financial institutions, there's no real benefit in competition here. It, you know, it is an area where we've seen banks come together and work in partnership uh, on some of these difficult issues, uh, and that's to be commended, and, and I'm sure it will continue. Well, that's a very good note to end on. Fiona, David, Linda, Joe, thank you very much for joining us. Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs> <laughs>